Hokey Cokey, here we go. Harry's been taking private jets again. Private jets to his polo tournament. Can you believe it? Humble Harry. Oh, so humble. I'm going to crumble. Private jets. He's got an addiction to them, hasn't he? We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, you know, I wanted to talk about William and Catherine today or any of the other royals to get off the subject of the Harkers, but they're all on holidays, my dear. They're all on holidays. August is a very quiet month for anything royal related. Uh, so they'll work back into action in a week or two. But the Queen's in Balmoral, as you know. Prince Andrew's staying with her. Relatives popping in and out. Friends here and there. So it's keeping her busy. Charles has been making a lot of visits to her. Much more than is his usual. And some rather spontaneous visits. Which is highly unusual. Because even though they're mother and son, usually a lot of planning goes into the, the scheduling and the visitations. This kind of thing. But he's been popping in. Few fears have been popping up that it's to do with her mobility and her health, but I try not to get carried away with those kind of things because every time there's been fear in the press, she pops back to life, doesn't she? And springs back. Springs back with more verve, more vigor and vim and energy than ever before. So I'm sure she'll continue to do that for a while more. Although there has been an exception taken uh, for the first time in her 70 year reign, she has made the decision to remain at Balmoral when she greets our new Prime Minister, who will be either Rishi Sunak or Liz Truss, due to be invested or invited to form a government in her name in early September. I think it happens on the 5th and then she will greet them on the 6th for the sort of kissing of the hand ceremony, if I'm not mistaken. And note this, Markle, this will be either our first brown prime minister. I believe his parents came from a Commonwealth realm. Fairly humble beginnings over here, but created a great business in the pharmaceutical business, uh, trade, retail. Came through, gave their son great education. He ended up there, Chancellor of the Exchequer and has a part of being the Prime Minister, but all the bets are on Liz Truss, who will be our third female Prime Minister in a country with a f female head of state for the last 70 years. In this oh-so-sexist patriarchal country. I mean, give me a break. How dare she besmirch this nation of all of them, as if we're some backwards country. The Queen could have chosen, by the way, to get Charles and William involved. As councillors of the state, they could have done the duties for her. But she has made the decision uh, because she's not the one to worry about cancelling engagements because she's 96 years old, very frail and in pain. She is not the type of strong, ambitious woman. She is not the type of woman to cancel when she can do her duty. Do you understand, my dear? And we'll be talking about royal duty. The Queen compared to Meghan a bit later in this broadcast. Congratulations to Prince Harry, A for winning his polo tournament and B for having a bestie in the form of Nacho Figueras. Old Nachos on toast, cheesy Nachos, who seems to be doing his own PR. He's like a walking, breathing puff piece for Prince Harry, isn't he? He's so eager to defend him, protect him, and seeing their, their friendship and their tight bond from the rooftops. So wonderful. Wonderful PR there. But Harry's been making headlines. And this Nacho told People magazine, of course, of course. People magazine full of ball sacks, if you know what I mean. Full of ball sacks, the sunshiny kind. He told people that they're so happy. They've bonded more than they ever have before. Well, they, they've got to bond with each other, haven't they, my loves? Because... They've ostracised themselves from everybody else. Friends, family, from what we hear. They've ostracised themselves. They've got to rely on each other, haven't they? He's completely reliant on her now. And old cheesy nachos, of course. Uh, I know firsthand how much he wanted to have a family. He found an amazing teammate. <laughs> an amazing teammate. You've got to be kidding me, my dear. Or partner in Megan. The only team she plays for is Team Mark on my love. Or, to be specific, Team Meg. Team Nutmeg. That's the only team she's ever played for, my dear. Harry's just an accessory, a wingman, a secondary character. 
down the list to her. The grand archetype of what it is to be royal and classy and a princess. And that's what's key. That's what's key. She is the living end. She is the heroine. Addictive like heroin. They love each other very much, he says. Their children are lovely. And of course, there was only one way to travel to this polo tournament. Only one way. With Harry's green credentials as founder of Travel List. Uh-oh, I think he forgot to go through his checklist. Because it involved a private jet. <laughs> of course, of course it did, a private jet. Not only a private jet for this uh, 1,000 mile trip to Aspen, by the way. Not only that, apparently his polo kit was transported in a separate car. Harry rocked up with all good intentions to the airport <laughs> in an electric car. So I think that was where he ticked off. Yes, I've done the right thing on this journey uh, because I'm beginning it in an electric car. So that's very green. And the rest of my luggage and my kit can go in the Range Rover with my staff, who were then spotted taking all his luggage, stowing it away into the undercarriages. And uh, then he leaves the electric car and pops onto a private jet. So thank thanks for that, Harry. How very green. Greta Thunberg will be online to congratulate you, my dear. You are setting such a good example to the world. I haven't got my plaques in today, but you know, Laura Ingle, she ain't, is she? Now, I will let him off the hook perhaps a little bit because this private jet is owned by Mark Gansey, a businessman and polo enthusiast, and it seems that it was already chartered to take much of the team there. So fair enough, there was that flight was already going to go with or without Harry, so he probably justified it by saying, well, it doesn't make any difference if I come or not, does it? And apparently the return flight back to Montecito was a regular passenger commercial airline, so it shows that it can be done, as far as I know, and I haven't done much digging, but I don't think any photos have emerged, I don't think there are any security incidents, so I don't really understand if he can do that on the way back, why he can do it on the way. And I don't really understand, even if he was joining a flight that was already chartered and was already due to go, how he didn't think that it was his responsibility to dissuade them from using a private jet because it's still not necessary. The entire team could have gone on a commercial airline or made other plans how to travel instead of using the most ungreen, unecologically sound mode of transportation, couldn't they? And don't get me wrong, if you think I'm looking for a sainthood, I'd take the private jet. I'd take the private jet. But the difference with me is that you wouldn't find me lecturing other people for doing the same. And it's lovely that the polo matches raise money for Harry's various activities and enterprises. This one, I think, raises money for Centre Bali. So that's great. But perhaps the money for chartering this private flight might have been better spent going towards Centre Bali. We're going to be talking a bit about the Queen and Meghan because a lot of the delicious commentary that's emerged after this furore over the Archetypes podcast, and you can take your pick because there's just a huge smorgasbord of critique out there in the wake of it. But so many people have been drawing comparisons, you see, to the royal spirit and Meghan's spirit and <laughs> highlighting the differences in the ways of thinking, especially when she made the huge mistake and she thought it was the Trump card because it got people talking. So, you know, fair enough. But it didn't really do her any favours when she brought to the fore this story of the, the fire, that blaze on fire that never really happened in Cape Town. Catherine English, thank God Elizabeth is queen. It makes you believe that God did ordain her. Now, I rather like that comment because yes, we are so lucky, aren't we? We are so lucky. She does, she is so perfect in many of our eyes, so perfect and has done such a flawless job that it does seem that God looked down and plucked this woman who seemed ready for queenhood even in her jejune years, even when she was virtually an infant, six, seven years old, seemed ready for the job. Astonished her own grandmother May. Uh, 
with how serious and uh, dutiful she was, even as a young Ben coming through, you know, and it seems that God just looked down and picked her out and said, that is the one. So we are blessed with all three of them, I believe. But in particular, of course, uh, and she's had the benefit of not having to go up in a less deferential age or a an age without social media or as much press intrusion to begin with. And also she had the benefit of finding the love of her life at a very early age and dear companion, a rock that she can lean on. You, you must always remember that. Not everyone, in fact, most people don't have that luxury of finding that strong staff of support. And she was, you know, barely out of kiddie bloomers. That sounds wrong, doesn't it? But you know, when she was just coming through, my dear. That was a great benefit to her. Even Regal Anne didn't get that right first time. And lots of people don't get it right. Or maybe they got it right for the time. But things evolved for a different path when it comes to relationships. She's great. And also we see that grace that the Queen has in Catherine. Catherine as well is such a, a brilliant egg that she seems almost divinely selected for William. You can see why Harry... Well, Harry said that it was Princess Diana looking down and saying, here you are, I'm sorting you out with Catherine. Now it's your turn, I'm gonna sort you out with Meghan. Please, please don't lay that, that blame at Diana's shoulders. I mean, whatever else she did, and she did some pretty reckless things, I really don't think that she would inflict on us the woman that would try to take down the monarchy and the institution that her first son represents. But your comments were timely, my dear, because I saw an article in the Daily Mail by Jan Moyer, and I hope you don't mind if I just read out a small segment of it, because I thought it was good. And it relates to the next comment that I'm going to read out from one of you guys. Jan Moyer says, Megan's horror at being expected to keep calm and carry on when no emergency occurred perfectly illustrates how Megan fatally confused being royal with being famous. If you're a rock star or a film star, you're very much the sun in your own orbit. Everything revolves around you. Being a royal is almost the exact opposite. This is what many people fail to understand. You represent the monarchy, not yourself. You are a cipher, an emissary of the crown, serving your country and not your own needs. You facilitate diplomatic and trade links while fostering investment opportunities. You also comfort the oppressed and recognise their suffering at every opportunity because that is what duchesses do. If Meghan had got her way, the Sussexes' trip to Cape Town's historic District 6 neighbourhood would have been axed following the fire scare. The couple were there to meet people who were forcibly relocated from there to the townships during the apartheid era. Imagine these people who had lost and suffered so much waiting with dignity in the afternoon heat for this long planned meeting with the royal couple, only to be told at short notice that they weren't coming after all because Meghan needed some post-stress me time. This has backfired really rather royally on Meghan, hasn't it? Hasn't it? As I said in the last broadcast, perhaps you know, we know she's clever, but maybe she's too clever for her own good because she didn't see this one coming, didn't she? She didn't see that, that this was the way that her fabulous story that she'd been cosseting and waiting for the right moment to put out into the ether. She didn't seem to see this one coming, did she? How it was going to play out and how the press were going to receive it and how they were going to compare it to how she should be behaving as a royal and how she wanted to behave in that instance, selfishly because there was no reason why she couldn't attend the next event, no reason whatsoever, especially when you've got a 96-year-old monarch in pain who was prepared to still work every day of her life and turn up at Prince Philip's funeral alone. Just like Tessa Thomas says in a comment, the Queen sat alone, uncomplaining in her 90s, when she'd lost her husband, and Meghan complained at being expected to carry on with royal duties for an alleged incident that happened the previous day was it the previous day or the same day? I thought it was the same day, but anyway, uh, you could be right. Uh, the previous day in her son's room, which was empty at the time. Therein lies the difference. It really does, doesn't it? And it's been exemplified for the whole world to see, which is what I've found so absolutely satisfying.
Sally Hurst says, I now totally understand the Queen. And I've had quite a few comments similar to this from people who were puzzled by the Queen's behaviour and royal behaviour in general in the past. I once had great difficulty in understanding Her Majesty's way of thinking in regards of handling Meghan, but now it makes perfect sense. Sit back, say nothing, and let Meghan bury herself. I get it. If only us mere mortals could hold Meghan with the same esteem in which she holds herself, we would all be okay. Can their self-importance and delusion get any worse? Yes, it can, and yes, it will, my dear. The more they're attacked, the more they're criticised, the more they will see it as proof that they're just way ahead of their time. They're out of the stratosphere. They're so forward thinking, so progressive, so key, so key to the modern world and where the future lies that, you know, the rest of us are just plebeians. We're just base ignoramuses, including the queen who just doesn't get it. You know, the queen should be out there talking to Oprah and Gail she should be, if she was going to fight back at all, she should come and give her view with Jeremy Kyle or Jerry Springer. You know, she should fess up. Uh, she should, you know, wring a few tears out of the equation. You know, after Prince Philip died, why didn't she come out and, you know, let her see her cry? It would have been fabulous PR for her. We can get old sunshiny ball sacks involved, can't we? Give her a real boost. No! As Jan Moyer says, that's the way of Hollywood superstars. Some of them, and I don't want to disparage all Hollywood superstars, but you know, the tacky vulgar ones that have been told that that is a regal way of behaving. No, my dear. The Queen gets it and the royal family in general get it. And that is why I am so proud of them. And I don't care that they're not all flawless as individuals. That is not what a monarchy and a royal family is about. It is about the fact that they in their public roles represent us collectively. It's not about them as individuals. And I don't expect them not to be human beings, but I do expect them to conduct themselves in a manner that reflects well. And when they don't, such as Prince Andrew, because he made bad decisions with regards to the connections he made, made during his life, then the Queen, as head of state, isn't you know, as much as it breaks her heart, will do what she has to do to protect the people she represents. Thank you for joining me on today's broadcast, my fruits, and I'll see you in the next show. If you'd like to treat me to a weekend coffee and a little slice of cake, my tip jar is in the description box below, or you can just blow me a kiss. I'll see you next time. Ta-ra!